Water infrastructure is a vital issue in all parts of the water sector as public infrastructure is public is currently at risk of failure or arguably has already failed. Lack of water infrastructure or the poor management of our water resources could result in economic water scarcity and it can affect the economic infrastructure of other sectors. So why do we have the Cuban engineers here and can they solve our water woes? Stay with us. When we come back, we're going to be talking to Dr. Anthony Turton about the state of our water. And welcome to the Water Hour. I'm your host, Bridgette Lambanda from Cape Town in South Africa. Today's stream is made possible by StreamYard and BeLive Media. In today's show, we're going to be talking to Dr. Anthony Turton about the state of our water infrastructure and what it takes to unlock water security. Um, and then a burning question currently at the moment is, what are the Cuban engineers doing here? Can they unlock water security? If you don't know Dr. Turton, he's a world-renowned scientist with over 24 years strategic level experience. He specializes in transboundary water resource management. He is widely published and is a well-known professional speaker, trainer, and facilitator. And so with that, I'm going to invite Dr. Turton to join us. Anthony, welcome to the show. Good Great evening. to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Good evening to you and the listeners. It's a pleasure to be here. I hope internet holds up because I've been having some internet challenges in the recent past. Yeah, that's unfortunately with everybody being online um, these days, it is what it is and we do the best that we can with what we've got available. <laughs> I want to start off by, yeah. by asking you, you know, what is the current state of our water resources in South Africa, do we have reason to be concerned? Uh, Brigetti, uh, yes. Um, our water resources, uh, as defined by by um, the the water that's available in rivers and dams, that is the resource. The national resource is water in rivers and dams. So unimproved water, not yet processed water. That is our national water resource. Is generally in in a in a in a very very de bad and deteriorating condition. Um, the reason for this is that we've had a problem of eutrophication for some years now, for in fact for decades. Eutrophication is the enrichment of water uh, through uh, through various processes, most notably sewage return flows, and this has been accelerating over the last um, two two decades. And at the same time, the uh, infrastructure has generally been failing at an accelerating rate. So the water resource today, I don't think I'm very far wrong in saying it. It's probably the worst quality it's ever been in, uh, in recorded history, depending on whatever parameter you choose to look at, whether it's water quality, whether it's you know, health aspects, whatever, the number of dams that are eutrophic, uh, you know, we really are in a very, very bad, bad state with, with respect to our water uh, resources nationally. So, Anthony, what I'm seeing uh, in the news that these, you know, it, 
Previously, it may have been isolated cases where you had infrastructure failing, but we're seeing this to become a, a countrywide phenomenon where infrastructure in almost all the provinces have failed. Is that is that a correct assumption? Yes, um, you're seeing accelerating failure. It's almost like a domino effect because you must appreciate that uh, water is an economic enabler. Uh, water is not only a basic human right, it, it actually powers the entire economy. And, uh, and water is supplied through a very complex supply chain from the resource, through a processing plant, through hundreds of, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of kilometers of piping, uh, through meters into millions of, of users' uh, facilities. And then, of course, after that, when it's used in the end destination, it then becomes waste, and that wastewater is now reticulated back to a wastewater treatment works where, where it is supposed to be treated back to a standard that's safe enough to be discharged back into the river, to be recycled back as, as potable or industrial process water. So uh, there's a domino effect because as one part of the system fails, so other parts of the system are put under enormous pressure and ultimately fail. And uh, there's an interesting element to failure because failure becomes accelerated at a moment in time when the infrastructure reaches its, 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 its design life uh, which in the case of most of our pipes and pumps and, 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 and water infrastructure in South Africa, we are approaching that uh, end of that useful life or have already passed that end of useful life. But it's accelerated by the fact that uh, the, the, the engineering staff uh, employed by government that need to make decisions about plans to refurbish, uh, to, uh, to schedule the refurbishment and upgrades, uh, to schedule the maintenance, to uh, do the costings, to call for quotations, you know, to procure the service providers. All of that takes an enormous uh, array of skills. And unfortunately, most of those skills were purged from, uh, from government uh, in, the, in, the, in the, the fervor and enthusiasm that followed our our, our liberation from from our historic uh, uh, oppression in 1994. So we are now accelerating. Uh, you know, literally one domino now causes another domino to fall, and it's becoming uh, an, an unstoppable force. Unfortunately. So, would you say that the situation we're finding ourselves in now is um, due to a problem with our engineers, or have they failed the country? No, it's not a problem of that the engineers have failed the country. We have highly qualified engineers, but the uh, the the enthusiasm that accompanied the transition to democracy saw a new broom sweeping clean, so to speak, and part of the clean sweep was to purge the civil service of, uh, of all vestiges of the past. And those vestiges of the past happen to be, to include amongst other things, administrators, trained, qualified administrators, but also trained, qualified engineers. And at the same revolutionary fervor that, that swept these people into oblivion also created a new set of procurement rules that excluded those very people from getting back into the game. So they were almost banished, if you like, uh, to a life of, uh, of purgatory, where they, they were unable to get back into, the, into economic activity other than by immigrating or by, uh, by joining consortia in which they were minority stakeholders. So ultimately, uh, it's been, a, it's been a, an unintended consequence of our transition to democracy. But then, of course, on top of that, uh, there's another level. These complex things always have multiple layers. And the other layer was the fact that uh, a decision was made uh, in 1994 or just before that to amalgamate certain uh, 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 municipalities where you would twin a rich, a rich neighborhood with a historically disadvantaged neighborhood 
in the belief that the that the rich neighborhood was better uh, resourced and would therefore manage to pull up the weak neighborhood next to it. But in reality, what happened, the reverse occurred, where the poor neighbor simply pulled down the rich neighbor and was uh, and, uh, just swamped the rich, the rich neighbor uh, in the quagmire of procurement and, uh, and grassroots politics at uh, municipal level. So therefore, we find ourselves today in a situation where, sadly, most municipal structures un are, are unable to even procure the necessary resources they need to get themselves out of the problem because in many cases they haven't even identified the problem correctly they've not even made the slightest effort to understand what the problem is uh, so therefore therefore uh, there's very little chance in my professional opinion of putting out of this uh, accelerated domino effect uh, failure that we see across the country so right now south africa has enlisted the help of cuban engineers um do they know something that our engineers in south africa cannot solve i mean um can you give us some insight as to what you think may be the the reason why the engineers are here and why they have not used South African engineers or are engineers not competent enough? Okay, we're getting there are many, many complexities in that question. So let us uh, unpack it uh, through different lenses so that we can get a better understanding of the underlying drivers. Let us take a hypothetical situation where a baby born uh on on the on on the day that we transitioned to a democracy in april 1994 that baby would be what, 27 years old today they would have gone through university and some of them would have qualified as engineers not so so why right. are those people the so-called born free generation why have they not been taken up into the ranks of the engineering a class of people well it could be to do with the fact that firstly education standards have been so lowered uh, because education has been so politicized that education has been regarded as a fundamental human right almost so right to free education has also meant that that free education uh, has had to be accessible to all therefore the standards uh, that uh, that determine the performance of that education system have been so dropped, so lowered, that uh, that the the people coming through the system are physically unable to do the work. And and I say this with great humility because I am active at regional level and SADC level, where this is actually a problem across the entire SADC region, not just South Africa. And uh, I was talking a while ago to a very senior engineer in one of our neighboring countries, uh, one of the SADC member states who lamented the fact that uh, he has people now on his staff that have got postgraduate engineering qualifications who are unable to design a very basic bridge, unable to design a very basic culvert, a very basic, uh, very basic uh, uh, dam design, nothing fancy, who are unable to calculate flows or friction losses or, or, or head lift uh, in the consumption of energy to move a given volume of water over over a certain distance these very very basic things and this all speaks to the fact that the education system in general has been has has been uh, hammered quite badly and standards have been lowered so therefore i would argue that the the people coming out of the universities are not necessarily employable on their own which goes to the next point of the of the argument and that is no engineer anywhere in the world comes out of university and walks straight into a, 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 a senior position uh, where they start designing dams and pump stations. It doesn't work like that. They all come under the mentorship of gray-haired old men like myself. That's just how it works. There's a mentorship program anywhere in the world uh, where you've got uh, uh, technical services of this nature. So what's happened to those grey-haired old men? Well, they were deemed to be uh, to be uh, unacceptable under the current dispensation, and therefore they've been put into either internal exile or they've been chased out of the country. 
and they've left, so they, they, they left for greener pastures. So we get back to the, you know, the fundamental problem that we've, uh, uh, in our enthusiasm for, for, for liberation, we have unfortunately thrown the baby out of the bathwater. And uh, therefore, we cannot, we cannot uh, use as an argument the fact that engineers are unwilling to go and live in rural areas when we fired those very engineers that were working there 20 years ago and sent them packing into no man's land and then, and then starved them into oblivion by denying them access to contracts that would otherwise have sustained them and, and retained the national skills level. So this, unfortunately, is what has happened in our country. Now, that's a very simplified version of it. It gets a lot more complex than that. But uh, can, I, can, I, can I just add one more thing? That engineers are in a very special category of professional people. If you consider professional people, take a lawyer as a professional person and take an engineer as a professional person. If a lawyer makes a mistake in a court of law, so that, you know he might not get the best judgment for his client, but in all probability is not going to be a catastrophic failure and loss of life. Engineers can't be like that. So engineers, when an engineer is designing the Eiffel Tower, for example, if that design is flawed and the tower comes collapsing on top of people, there is significant loss of life. So engineers all over the world, wherever you wherever you find them are considered to be a professional class of people. And, and as a professionals, they are, they, they, they are registered by various uh, uh, councils or bodies of professional, uh, uh, let's call them adjudicators. So for example, in so South Africa generally follows the old colonial British model, where once a, uh, 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 a person graduates with an engineering degree, they get a job, but they don't yet have the right to call themselves a professional engineer. When they, when they find that they are, are, are qualified enough, when they've met certain, uh, certain technical criteria, they get interviewed by, by the, the, the uh, authorizing authority, and they then get the right to, or they get allocated a number, PR engineer, engineer mm. number. And after their name, they can now say, Joe Smith, uh, B Eng. Uh, PR Eng, you know, so Bachelor of Engineering and Professional Engineer and their number, they will quote their number. Now, the same with scientists. Scientists also have, have, have uh, pre, pre nat scheme, a professional natu natural scientist for the same reason. And uh, the same with medical doctors. Medical doctors have to be authorized, you know, to, to practice because their judgment can mean loss of life. Now, this is practiced globally. So in, in America, you find uh, an engineer carries uh, carries uh, uh, the designation of the name of PE, professional engineer. If you go to Australia, uh, you find that they are chartered, chartered professional engineer, much like a chartered accountant. Uh, so then you get a CPN, chartered professional engineer. And only a chartered professional engineer can sign off on designs and can basically uh, uh, authorize the final uh, calculations that, 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 that are inherent to any, any complex design like a dam uh, or a pump station or something of that nature. So, so this, this is practiced at global level, but it's coordinated by, by a body that was agreed to internationally in a multilateral uh, agreement known as the Washington Accord. And the Washington Accord sets the global standards to which all signatory countries must comply in their engineering certifications. So South Africa is a, is a signatory to the Washington Accord. Unfortunately, Cuba is not. So no Cuban engineer in the world is recognized as a professional engineer. And in fact, so if you go to any of the Arab countries, the Arab countries hold an engineer in such high regard that even if... Sorry, so, 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 so even... So, so a professional, an engineer in the Arab world is not even called a Mr. or Mrs. Mrs. They are called engineer. They are given this, the given the title of their of their of their profession, engineer Smith or engineer Muhammad Iqbal. Okay, uh, that's what they're called. So engineers are are held to a special special status. And what's important is all of your funding agencies, your world banks, your 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 your, your development banks, the 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 people that that fund infrastructure upgrades. Those people would require a chartered professional engineer 
to have signed off on designs before they would put one cent of money into any of those projects. So this is a very, very important issue because it comes down to the culpability. As a professional engineer, you personally sign your name at the bottom of that of a document and you say that I have certified this. If something goes wrong, I carry the legal liability and then there's a whole, a whole host of of, of professional indemnities uh, that you know that, that the individual professional engineer has to carry, and so it's an onerous task. That is, uh, you know, and that's that, that's the important thing. But uh, unfortunately, the Cubans are are are, are free of that uh, encumbrance. Uh, so I'm not quite sure which of the banking institutions would be willing to sign off on 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 on, on uh, investments into infrastructure designed and, uh, and 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 calculated by these people I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't know what the answer to that question is well as a layperson to me that is that surely is problematic I know that you know even if a doctor were to come to South Africa from another country they would still have to sit through an exam to prove their competency to practice medicine in South Africa. Is that similar in engineering? I would imagine so, but I'm 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 asking. Yes, it is. Uh, it is because in order to carry a, a, a chartered professional engineering uh, a number uh, or professional engineering number, you have to be certified by the local the local certifying board, and that like local certifying board has got a certain standard that they have defined, and that has been approved globally. Uh, in terms of this Washington Accord. So uh, if you get a South African engineer uh, immigrating to Australia, for example, they have to reset in Australia and they have to, they, they can work as an engineer, but under supervision of another of another chartered professional engineer. And they will then ultimately be, uh, you know, it's almost like pass the board exam or you know, for want of a better word, uh, because you've got to be familiar with the local regulations. You know, the local the local regulations on on design you know on on on, on there, there are many many design factors uh, so one has to at least be familiar with the local uh, the local laws the local regulations the local uh, the, the local uh, or health and safety standards etc which differ from country to country so at that level alone one has to be compliant but then of course uh, you know you might find that uh, that that uh, an, a dam built in one country uh, so let's say in a developing country might not have the same design criteria as a, as a dam designed, for example, in the United States of America. But still, there would be a minimum criteria for, for, for both of those because those are, are defined by the Washington consensus. So it comes down to, to safety uh, and the safety of these big structures and the reliability of the services that ultimately emanate from engineering on, on, on essentially a national scale. That, that's what it's about. So tell me the Cuban engineers then who are here, so they've, they've arrived in South Africa. Um, is it then correct to assume that they cannot simply start working until they have done the board exam? Um, you know, and is that, at, would that be at South Africa's expense? Well, or is that a... Well, because I think, surely I think these you'd people have to speak to now. someone, yeah. you know, in the in 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 the uh, uh, in the in engineering council to give you that, to give you that, that on. Yeah. Well, they they okay. What we've seen happening in South Africa, I'm being diplomatic now. What we've seen happening in South Africa is a parallel legal system that's unfolded. So there's one legal system for everybody, and then there's another legal system for for the elite, the connected few. So I would think that uh, in terms of the of the of the normal rule of law, these people ought to sit for some kind of certification, and in fact they ought to also be considered uh, in terms of your immigration laws, because your uh, one of your requirements for an immigration visa uh, is a scarce skill. So if you if you if you have a scarce skill that's not available in the in your host country, then that fast tracks your visa process. So the first Which question is not would be, the case in South does this Africa, person right? have a scarce skill measured against the national data? It cannot be. It cannot be because the, the because the, the the engineering profile in Cuba differs fundamentally from the engineering profile in South Africa. Cuba is a small island in a tropical area, 
uh, they don't make use of groundwater to any significant extent. They don't make use of interbasin transfers. They don't make use of uh, of, uh, of filtration processes other than than the sand trickle gravity feed system. They actually uh, uh, don't have water services to more than 60% of their population. These are the facts at the moment. About 60% of the population has access to improved services. And they've, uh, my understanding is they've got over a thousand wastewater works, um, most of which are, are dysfunctional or, or at best rudimentary. You must remember that Cuba has been under American sanction since the, the Bay of Pigs invasion in the 1960s. So Cuba is famous for the fact that it's still, you still find motor cars from the 1950s uh, 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 being driven there. So I would argue that what a Cuban uh, uh, technical person is good at is keeping old machinery going for longer than the design life. That's, that I would argue is their core unique skill. However, the skills that we require in South Africa are, are different because one of the important uh, elements uh, in South Africa is interbasin transfer of water. South Africa is one of the most advanced countries in the world in terms of linking one river basin to another to the extent that, that almost all river basins of significance in South Africa have been, have been connected through very complicated pipes and pumps and, and, and dams and tunnels through mountain ranges, etc. Now, that is, a, that is a skill that is unique. In fact, South Africa exports that skill set. Uh, uh, another country that has that skill set is Turkey because they, they've got similar issues in Turkey. And, of course, when, when, uh, when Australia started building the Snowy Mountain uh, engineering scheme, the Snowy Mountain project uh, in, the, in the New South Wales uh, area of, uh, of Australia, they imported the skills from elsewhere because of the tunneling and, and all that kind of skill that, 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 that they didn't have in Australia. Even, even Australia as a mining country didn't have those sort of skills. So the Cubans don't have that profile. And uh, there's the, the, the track record of the Cuban government uh, ha at best provides improved drinking water to 60% of the population. So even as bad as we are at the moment, more than 90% of our population still has access to improved drinking water. It might not always be there and there's no interruptions in, in supply, but certainly more, it's approaching 100%, 98 odd percent. I don't know what the exact number is, but it's certainly more than 90% of our people have access to improved water. So we can actually teach them rather than the other way around. And in terms of wastewater works, we've got 824. They've got, I'm, I'm told, over a thousand. Uh, and uh, from what I, I can gather, their wastewater works are in much the same kind of dire straits as ours are. So there's no, they're not gonna teach us there other than how to keep broken machines uh, functioning, okay? Which becomes a procurement issue in South Africa, because now you slap up against the procurement requirements, the legal requirements for BE mandated uh, supply chain management. And that's not going to change unless you, you know, unless you can uh, work magic wonders behind the backs of people. But from a legal perspective, that cannot change. So my answer, in other words, is I don't see what skills the Cubans bring that would be defended, defendable in a, in a court of, in a labor court uh, where a visa application is now being defended, for example, because they just don't have the skills, the special skills that we lack. We, we have those skills in the country. They're not scarce. They are just not deployed for, 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 for reasons related to, to, to you know, political decision making rather than technical reasons. That was going to be my, my next question to you with regards to competency and you know what were the similarities between South Africa and and Cuba um, I know we share a lot in common with Australia so it would have made sense if we had engineers from Australia coming to South Africa because we our conditions are so similar but I was trying to find you know trying to see what the similarities were and what the thinking possibly was um, behind choosing Cuba but significantly, as you said, that they're not signatories to the Washington Accord um, in terms of their culpability or um, accountability should things go south. Well, 
I, I'm confident that there will be no accountability ever for these people. I'm confident in saying that. Um, I'm pretty sure they, uh, I mean, I haven't verified for fact, but I'm pretty sure that, that they would be almost regarded with some kind of diplomatic immunity, if you like, you know. If something goes wrong on their watch, I doubt very much that anyone would have a, have a direct legal recourse to, uh, to any consequences. I, I, I would argue that what, what we ought to have been doing for the last 20 years was incentivizing the transfer of skills from, from the pale male balding white professional to the emerging young black male or female uh, uh, engineer that has come through the ranks. That's what we should have been doing for the last two and a half decades. But we haven't done that because the 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 uh, the black engineers that have come through the system have been so scarce and so valuable. Uh, became because of the BEE procurement uh, uh, laws uh, that pertain to consulting engineering companies, uh, those uh, uh, engineers have been highly sought after and have been snapped up very rapidly. So they generally have not gone into the civil service. Now they, they would earn a salary way bigger than the civil service in the private sector. And in those roles, they would be under the supervision of, of, uh, you know, of, of, uh, of more elderly, uh, matured, uh, experienced people. And there, there you would get the transfer of skills. But what has been happening over the last uh, two decades has been a gradual uh, throttling of the flow of, 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 of projects into that professional engineering community. And uh, part of the BE procurement rules have played a very, very big role, where, where if you are, happen to be a, a director of a, of a company that, 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 that uh, is in the business of, uh, of professional engineering, uh, you know, consulting engineering, then, then you've been obliged to ultimately comply with the PE regulations. And of course, uh, you have to tender for work. And if, you don't, uh, if you're not compliant, you can't get a tender. So therefore, you get starved of work. So that's the first hurdle. First hurdle has been that. And, and that, one can argue that that might, might have been a good idea because it might have, 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 have legislated the transfer of skills. But it didn't really, at the end of the day, it didn't actually transfer the skills. And so we have to eventually sit back and ask what happened there. But, what, but then, of course, the next thing that happened now was that the, the tender system generally became corrupted. So, so no matter, even if you were BEE compliant and, uh, and, and fully legally compliant as a contractor, there was still no guarantee that you would get the, get the tender because tenders were not allocated ultimately on, uh, on technical grounds. They were allocated as, uh, you know, as part of patronage. So, so there was this, uh, the, you saw, you saw the, the entry into the market of unqualified people uh, that, uh, that over overpriced things and part of the overpricing was the general willingness to uh, to grease the palms of those that facilitated the transaction now what this did to the engineering profession was devastating absolutely devastating because as a professional engineer one would look at that with horror and and i i don't want to speak on behalf of anybody but i i believe that the majority of professional engineers would not want to be party to such transactions. It just, it just runs contrary to the professional ethic. So now you're faced with a very, very difficult reality, a harsh reality. If you don't play that game, you don't get contracts. If you don't get contracts, you can't pay your staff. You can't pay the rent for the building that you, that you occupy. You can't keep your company going. And now it would be very interesting if you could get somebody in at some stage to talk about uh, how many of the big uh, 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 consulting engineering companies that are multinationals, how they have downsized in South Africa, how they've actually effectively disinvested from South Africa. And yes, they've transferred uh, uh, um, a majority ownership over to BE uh, 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 shareholders, but they haven't transferred skills. And so now you have a situation where these companies have got the, uh, have got the legal, uh, the legal uh, threshold that they've met, but they don't necessarily have the skills that are required for reasons that I've explained early on in this interview.
So, so, so you know, we've really seen a, a gradual throttling of the of the of the profession, and I, I would argue that your consulting engineers probably uh, uh, contain within them the, that cohort eighty percent of the technical skills of the country. Uh, so the other the other twenty percent of the technical skills would have been resident in in different civil civil structure civil uh, 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 um, uh, government bill, uh, government offices. For example, the old Department of Water and uh, Water Affairs had a had a, a highly qualified cohort of engineers that were that were doing long term strategic planning and 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 were responsible for different river basins river basin management etc. Um, so, so I would have argued in the past, eighty percent of the skills in the country would have been in the in the private sector. Twenty percent would have been a combination of in government uh, offices and in places like the CSIR, which were quasi-government institutions. Um, so, eighty twenty is what it would have been like then, uh, just as a as a kind of uh, as a kind of arbitrary number. It's uh, it's now changed completely. I would I would say that of the skills that we had 20 years ago in the in private uh, practice we we're lucky if we have 20 percent of those skills left in south africa today as in a viable form we're lucky because all of the younger engineers have simply seen that this is a this is a fight not worth fighting and they've mostly immigrated to, to other parts of the world so we have a situation now where lots of young people the, the best and brightest have left the country and you've got uh, some of the older folk that don't want to leave or are either in very high demand, so they travel internationally. Uh, but then there's a there's a group of people that that don't want to leave the country, but they are unemployable because they don't meet the uh, the BEE threshold, and that's uh, that's the reality. You know, where uh, uh, it would be, in my view, in our national best interest to sit down in a in a calm and rational way uh, between government and the organised engineering professions. To negotiate around a kind of cadessa, if you like, for the engineering services, to negotiate how these uh, old, pale, male, grey-haired men could 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 uh, could assist by transferring the necessary skills, because uh, you know we still have, even though we only have about twenty percent left, we still have very very important skills, and we if we don't retain them, I think another twelve months, a year or so from now, we won't have them at all. And that is the reason why we created the, the SA Business Water Chamber was literally to try and and stabilize what was left of a collapsing uh, water services supply chain because uh, that's really what what we've seen happening. Whether we hope we're going to succeed, we are enthusiastic about the mission we're on, and uh, we're trying our very best. But ultimately, government holds all the power because they are the ones that allocate the contracts. It's as simple as that. It's the uh, the golden rule applies. He who owns the gold rules, and the, the person signing off on that contract, the person that, that allocates that tender, that's the person that has the power. And they are just not giving contracts to uh, to these uh, to these private sector companies. Anthony, I want to just talk for a minute about uh, some of the municipalities where the infrastructure has failed completely. Just everything's fallen apart. Um, and private citizens have been given the authority to keep the taps going. Um, is is that the way forward, or, or what are the kind of problems one can encounter if that becomes the norm? Should it become the norm? This is a very interesting trend that we're starting to see emerge in South Africa, where the courts are now starting to grant authority to organized private citizen groups i was uh, i was part of uh, one of these in uh, in harry smith um uh, towards the end of last year i was a so called expert witness in the, in the in their application uh, which i won in the high court and and you're getting uh, you're now getting private citizens in an organized forum uh, in an organized not for profit company starting to deliver services you're seeing this happening all over the show now what's interesting about this is that um, they create a not-for-profit company, an NPO. So it's a not-for-profit company that is created. But by going the not-for-profit company route, 
your executive decision makers are now subject to the Companies Act. And that's an important thing because this leads us into a conversation about the labor law versus commercial law in South Africa. And, and unfortunately, uh, the la well, the labor, labor people, labor, labor practitioners and, 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 and advocates and, uh, and activists would argue that this was a victory in 1994, a victory for collective bargaining, victory for organized labor, the right to unionize, et cetera, et cetera. But if you look at this very carefully now, what that has done is uh, it has separated two things. And we're going to need to understand this very carefully, because this, I think, is very critical to what's happened in the country. So they've separated two things in, 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 our, in, our, in all of our legislation, but particularly evident in our labor legislation. They've separated the rights from duties, obligations, and responsibilities. So rights and, and responsibilities are separated. And in general, I'm talking now in a general, general way, your historically disadvantaged entities, which was labor, have inherited enormous rights, but very few responsibilities, very few obligations. And the historically advantaged, which generally is the private sector, owners, managers, investors, people that employ other people, employers, in other words, they've inherited all of the responsibilities, duties, and obligations, and very few rights. So it's that labor law that now lies at the heart of the problem in the municipalities, because all of your civil servants today hide behind labor law, and they cannot be fired, they cannot be held accountable. And let us look no further than, than uh, there would be two cases that I would use as, uh, to, to illustrate it. The first case is where a municip municipal manager or, and his team is found to be delinquent and having squandered uh, you know, um, millions of, of, of rands of taxpayers' money and just basically uh, being involved in maladministration. Well, where's the culpability there? Because all they do is they get suspended on full pay. They sit at home for two, three years while the case is being processed. They don't, there's no sanction. They don't lose any income or any benefit. Their pension still continues to grow. And ultimately, they, they cannot be dismissed and they're not found guilty. Let's take another example, which, is, which has affected us all in the COVID-19 crisis. How many government departments today are fully functional because of COVID? Uh, they, it just takes one government worker to say, oh, somebody sneezed today. My, my rights have now been trampled upon. I'm going to get COVID. The employer is responsible to keep me safe. I cannot work. And I'm, you must send me home on full pay until, until we can make the they make the, 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 the office safe again. Well, we can't make the office safe. There's a virus everywhere. So there's a big, lots of contracts for cleaning services, deep cleansing services, but the, the building is never cleaned out properly because the civil servants are now sitting at home on full pay without actually having the burden of, 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 of or the responsibility of having to deliver. And this lies, I think, at, at the heart of our municipal failure. Because whenever you get a, 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 into a situation where you start finding uh, malfeasance and, uh, and, 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 and illegal conduct by people in, in, in positions of uh, fiduciary responsibility, they always hold up the Labor Act. I oh, know no, you can't suspend me or a, a, a due process must be done. And, uh, you know, you, you've got to give me a, a, written author, a written notification. Then I've got a right to appeal this. And it all becomes part of this, the Labor Relations Act. So we are being governed by the Labor Relations Act, which drives us deeper and deeper and deeper into the quagmire of the crisis, because it means that, that the very entity that is supposed to make the decisions to turn the ship around is unable to make the decisions needed to turn the ship around. And the very rules and laws uh, uh, governing procurement are unable to procure the, the goods and services required in the time frame required in order to turn the ship around. So we've got to a situation where through the complexity of our own laws, uh, compounded or exacerbated by the inflexibility of the uh, labor, labor law system, uh, behind which all of your uh, municipal workers and government workers uh, always hide, uh, you have a situation where you were never going to hold anyone to account. And ultimately, this has just eaten up the budget 
uh, all the budget's gone into into wages and benefits, and there's no more budget left for for operations and maintenance. And it's been like this for the last twenty years, and that's why we are where we are. So, Anthony, can we close off by um, asking how do we as citizens hold the government responsible for delivering a service? Oh, that's a very, it sounds like a simple question. I mean, I, I, I will predicate the answer there on a, on a, on a, on a, on a fiction. If, if we are a functional constitutional democracy, then the constitution ought to protect the rights of the citizens against its own government. But we are not in a functional constitutional democracy. The democracy, see, in a functional constitutional democracy, one of the key elements of that constitution is to separate powers, uh, what's known as the trias politicas, the executive, legislature, and judiciary, always separated in a functioning uh, a, a democracy. And and within your legislative body, your 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 uh, um, House of Parliament, you have oversight committees, and those oversight committees, SCOPA is an example of that. Uh, the the oversight committee's role is to hold government accountable, but it's failed. It's failed. Uh, we've got the Zonda Commission that tells us to what extent we have failed. We've we've got this thing coming out of uh, Tokyo Sehwali now about what is it, 31 quintillion rand that is now allegedly gone missing. Uh, is it 31 or so 30 something quintillion? Quintillion, quintillion rand. I don't even know how many zeros there are in a quintillion. So it's not it's not millions, it's not billions, it's 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 quintillions we're talking about now. Now, surely this is an indictment of the parliamentary oversight process. Because if the parliamentary oversight process was functional, surely we would have smelt the roses before we get to the first quintillion, let alone the third. So if we did not smell the roses before the first quintillion, then I would argue that we are not a functioning uh, constitutional democracy. So therefore, the, the rights of the citizens don't actually exist. Uh, they are there on paper only. And yes, the constitutional court will make a ruling in favor of people generally. They, they, they're quite good. But ultimately, who's held accountable? Who's, who, where's the law ultimately enforced? So it comes down to the fact that I think the pivotal question is not how do we hold our elected officials accountable. An even more pressing question for me is, are we actually a functioning constitutional democracy? Yes or no? And if we are not, then why continue to pretend that we are? Because that pretense is simply empowering those, those that are stealing the three of the 31 quintillion rand whether that's a true number or not, I don't know. But but that 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 quantum of money uh, is is being stolen, uh, and we how can we ever hope to recover? Certainly, twenty four uh, engineers that are not uh, not party to the Washington Accord, imported from Cuba, will not solve that problem uh, with the best intention in the world. So I think it's uh, we've got to ask ourselves a very big question. And, and I'm going to say something now. This last weekend, I was in a, a workshop. Uh, a reconciliation workshop, a, a very interesting workshop um, in, the, in the hills of, uh, in, about on top of Goethe's Hill between Peter Maritzburg and Durban, uh, famous for the comrades. And uh, what was fascinating there was there were, there were veterans from all of the liberation movements who were present at that meeting. And there were a couple of SADF uh, veterans of which I was one. And we were there by invitation as, as SADF for veterans. But what, what was fascinating about that was listening to the depth of anger from the Liberation Force veterans at the way that they, what they fought for and what they've been given are two completely different things. So these, I don't want to speak on their behalf, but certainly from what I heard from that workshop, the level of anger is deep. The level of, of, of the profound, profound discontent is, is, is palpable. And I would even argue, if that's the case, uh, let's give them the benefit of the doubt for this argument now. 
Then we, then we take Minister Sisulu, who is now proudly sitting there and pontificating about the importation of, of Cuban engineers. And I would liken this in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a kind of metaphoric sense to be much the same as Marie Antoinette before the French Revolution saw her beheading. You know, where, 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 where decisions of a frivolous nature are foisted on to a growing and increasingly restless uh, a populace, general populace. So you can continue foisting these decisions onto people for a certain period of time, but the level of anger and the, the is effervescing. There's an effervescence, that's the best way to describe it, happening at grassroots level. People that have been that have been kept out of employment, people who that are sole breadwinners in their family and have got no chance of getting a job because water is an economic enabler. And one of the things they have to battle with every day is either water or energy or lack of jobs. Those are the, those are the three issues they battle with. And then, of course, health, health, health crisis all the time. So these are the day-to-day -day grinds of the, of the ordinary citizen. So how can, uh, with due respect, how can a Marie Antoinette sit there and, and pontificate about the about let them eat crumbs kind of uh, you know, kind of debate, an inappropriate solution uh, 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 applied to a completely misread uh, misreading of a complex problem, and I think that's where we are headed now. So I'm afraid it's a long answer to your simple question: how we can hold them accountable. I think they're going to be held to account one of two ways, and the one way is either we're going to have another revolution that is going to become more radical than the last one with more loss of life because your security forces are less, are less orderly, less organized, command and control is not what it used to be. The equipment isn't, isn't as functional as it used to be. So we're going to get that kind of factionalism within the security force community, uh, which is going to be unpleasant and bloody with probably more loss of life there than we had before 1994. That's the one option. The other option would be a sort of a peaceful, the peaceful emergence of what I refer to the moderate middle. And the moderate middle would be made up uh, probably of, of ordinary citizens that are deeply impacted negatively by the collapse of, amongst other things, water services. Remember, water services is only one of the things that are collapsing. You know, the the uh, energy sector and potholes and roads mm. and, 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 and jobs, that's a, all, all, all parallel processes, just as significant as water. But uh, I would see the emergence of a moderate middle uh, made up of people who are not affiliated to any of the historic political parties, because all of these, all of the political parties up to now have become so, so, uh, so tainted, uh, so, uh, so, so inappropriate to meeting the needs of the day-to-day -day citizen that I don't see any of them as being relevant uh, in the future. So that's what I see, either the revolutionary outcome bloodletting and uh, almost to the point where where I wouldn't quite say the guillotine but but that kind of accountability uh, in a street street violence accountability is meted out that's the one option and the other option is uh, the emergence of a moderate middle uh, that moderate middle made up of people across the across the uh, the political spectrum uh, people that just have got a common an inter an issues based a, a, a political system where, where where people find consensus on on the, the absence of jobs, on the need for invest restoration of investor confidence, for the need to grow the economy, for the need to you know to liberalise the labour market, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And um, I, I'm kind of optimistic that the moderate middle is likely to emerge, but um, I, I'm not. Uh, I think we've got a little bit of a way still to go before that happens. Anthony, thank you very much much you know appreciate your time and thank you for sharing your your insights on on the um current situation with our water infrastructure and um and for giving us some more insight on to the into the cuban engineers and how that is good or not good for south africa thanks very much appreciate your time I wish I had more happy news to share to me because I'm actually a fundamentally optimistic and happy guy. But I mean, these are facts are our friends. And remember, water is an economic enabler. Thank you very much. 
Absolutely. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Take care, stay well, and um, let's use our water wisely.